Good evening, and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival, this year in a special hybrid form. My name is Matt Widmar, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's memorial lecture, dedicated to Caroline Wickham Jones, an outstanding archaeologist and a true Orcadian. She first visited Orkney with family, and later on, many times, both as an, as when an archaeologist student, first at the University of Edinburgh and later at Birmingham, to excavate Scarra Bray and other Neolithic sites. In 1980s, she found what was then the oldest known settlement in Scotland at Kinloch on Rum. Later on, she was um, she established the research directories for Orkney World Heritage Site, and she moved permanently to Orkney in 2002, collaborating on a project that explored its changing coasts and looked for drowned settlements. That is why it is part I'm particularly delighted to be welcoming to our midst Professor Martin Bates, who will be talking about the legacy of her work, including investigations of the Bay of Firth and the lochs of Stennis and Harry. After Martin's talk, there will be, be, be time for some questions. As you may already be accustomed to, this year's questions can be sent in via Slido. A QR code will appear on the screen and you can scan it to join uh, Slido online. Or indeed, if you just go to slido.com and use the code 3435541, -5 you can also join that way. If you are watching this on YouTube, in fact, or you're all watching this on YouTube, um, and you'd prefer not to use Slido, you can drop your questions into the YouTube chat itself as the talk goes on. But now let me introduce you to today's speaker. Professor Martin Bates from the University of Wales Trinity St. Davis is an interdisciplinary scholar combining a number of disciplines, including archeology, span quaternary geology, engineering geology, and environmental science. He has been involved in a number of major discoveries within the UK archeological world, including the Dover Bronze Age boat, the Clectonian elephant butchery site in Ebelfest, the Harnsham Terminal Lower Paleolithic site near Salisbury, and he discovered the Hepisbra human footprints in, in Norfolk, the all, all that's presently known in the world outside of Africa. So indeed, we are delighted to have you with us tonight, Martin, and for now, it's over to you to explore some of the hidden Orcadian treasures. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you very much to the organizing committee for, for inviting us to give, give this talk um, in uh, memory of Caroline, who was a, a very great collaborator with us um, and also a, a very good friend um, whom I, I know we all miss um, terribly every, every day since um, she passed away. So hopefully I'll do you justice this afternoon, this evening, um, Caroline, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, the, the talk I'm giving is um, a, a talk really on work that a number of us are doing. And, and this particular talk has been put together uh, by myself, uh, as well as my brother, Richard Bates and Sue Dawson, who are some of the um, older members in, in the team. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you about is, is um, what we've been doing, what Caroline set up, how we ran the project or how she ran the project, how we all collaborated on it, show a couple of examples. Uh, and, and show where we're going, because this work doesn't stop here. This work is, is ongoing, and, and, and we clearly want to continue the legacy of Caroline's wonderful um, ideas and vision for Orkney. So next slide, please. So what is the Rising Tides project? A lot of people keep asking me what, what this is, and, and it, it's um, uh, a, a project with numerous members who come together in various combinations over the years to really understand what's happened to um, sea level and sea uh, coastal uh, zones around Orkney um, since the last glacial maximum when sea levels are at their lowest and how the rising sea levels have impacted on um, the landscape and also the human settlement in later prehistory. Um, and here in Orkney we've um, uh, examined a number of sites on mainland as well as uh, on the island of Sunday. Next slide please. So who are the Rising Tides Project? Well, it began with um, Caroline, um, Sue uh, and Ali Dawson um, back in probably the late uh, noughties, I think, um, and has since expanded uh, initially to include uh, my brother Richard, who came in to help 
um, Sue and Caroline in particular with um, imaging the bottom of some of the uh, bays that they were interested in investigating. And then with a range of other people, both from um, some of England, such as John Whittaker, um, Michelle Farrell and Jane Bunting looking at pollen, but also Scott uh, Timpany, who uh, obviously is at um, uh, Orkney College, um, Day Hughes from Bangor, as well as various MA and PhD students. And, and, and the work that we've all carried out has fed into um, these students' projects, because of course it was one of Caroline's um, great interests to encourage uh, new and up and coming um, <clears throat> archeologists. And, and um, hopefully our work reflects that um, breadth. Next slide, please. So here we are. Um, Richard pointed out that we look awfully an awful lot younger in this picture. It was taken, I don't know, about maybe 10 years ago um, when some of our work um, that you can see on the background there we, we, was transformed into um, public outreach. Um, and here we have myself, Sue, Caroline, Day Hughes from Bangor and, and Richard as, as um, part of the team that um, has been undertaking this work. Um, next slide, please. Another question that I often get asked is, is, is where was the tiding, uh, Rising Tides project actually based? Well, mainly in Caroline's house. We, we all uh, tended to um, congregate there. Next slide, please. And the hub of the operation was Caroline's dining room, as it was before the extension to the house. And here you can see um, data processing, uh, as well as some wine drinking going on. And, and, and Caroline's house... To those of you that know or knew her and, and remember her, it was always open to people, was always a, a, a thriving hub of um, discussion, whether it be about archaeology, um, about gin, uh, about the Orkney landscape, or, or families and, and friends. And, 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 you know, this is where we, we based ourselves um, when we came into to, to the house to, to work. And, and we would tend to come up maybe two to three times a year for, for a week to do intensive field work, not just in the nice summer months, but sometimes in, in the dark and the depth of winter. And my, my introduction to the Rising Tides project was in 2009 or 2010 and came up in January and there was snow on the ground and actually the Bay of Firth was partially frozen. So um, that was my introduction to, to, to Orkney. Next slide, please. Her garage also played an important role um, in, in the project. And you can see here the um, garage and the table tennis uh, table being um, uh, used and not necessarily for what it was intended to be used for. But we, Richard and I, and the boys, as she used to refer to us, um, as, a, as a store for all our toys, all our equipment. You can see Richard sizing up some core tube there, a couple of cores that we've um, extracted from the Bay of Firth, laid out for examination um, on the table there. And for a number of years, we, we, we cluttered poor Caroline's garage with the, our debris between trips because we left lots of it um, in her uh, property. Eventually, she decided she'd had enough of, of us taking over her garage, and she actually built Rich and I a shed where we could put everything on the back of our house neatly away. She was then able to reclaim the garage and, and um, return the garage to some semblance of normality. Um, next slide, please. But as I mentioned, working with Caroline um, and Sue and the others up in Orkney wasn't just about the archaeology. Gin um, was, was an important part of it. And here you can see Richard and Caroline in Liddles in, in, in Kirkwall stocking up for the week. Um, but also the burger shacks around the island was a, a prominent part of the trip as far as, as Richard and I were concerned. And I think we know most of them um, around the island and clearly have our favourites. Um, so the, the experience of, of being um, there was, was an all-round experience. But back to the focus of the talk and um, the prehistoric landscapes of Scotland um, since the last glacial maximum here. Um, what interest Caroline, for those of you who, who are not so familiar with archaeology, was, was the earliest settlers? When did they first come into um, Scotland? How did they get there? Um, and um, what sort of... Uh, environments were they coming into, what environments were they exploiting, and what tr um, traces of those environments um, are left at the present time. And, and this talk is going to be about showing how um, the, the project 
investigated some of those um, questions. And there's still a lot of questions left to be answered, which we hope we can do some justice to in, in the future. Next slide, please. So the Rising Tides project is about submerged prehistory. It's about trying to um, find out, locate that submerged prehistory. And, and so what I'm going to go through in the examples from the Bay of Firth and, and the Loch of Stennis is just show you how we map those landscapes, the tools we use um, to do that, um, how the submerged landscapes can be fitted with those of today, the methods we're using to interpret these ancient landscape and something about the um, the nature of that change. And then say something about how we actually recognize sites within these landscapes. Um, it's very difficult um, to uh, identify sites on the seabed um, and how do we do it and what sort of problems do we face? And then say something a little bit about how we begin to repopulate these landscapes with people. Next slide, please. So the sites we've been working on, um, the majority of our work is focused around the Bay of Firth, which is um, due west of um, Kirkwall, which is uh, site number one on the right-hand side there. We've also worked around uh, the Loch of Stennis and Harry, site number five, with Scott uh, and the Orkney um, College people around site four, the Bay of Ireland. We've done some work, but it's still ongoing at scale and Scarra Bray, and then also at Poole and the Bay of Bruff in, in um, Sandy. Next slide, please. So to investigate these lost landscapes, we need more than the usual pair of boots uh, and, uh, um, and a knapsack that uh, uh, terrestrial archeologists use. Of course, we need boats um, and we need equipment to um, record what's beneath the waves. Um, and you can see uh, two of the little vessels that we've been using um, for this survey work here on the left. Um, a small boat at the top um, used to uh, map the very shallowest waters um, where water depths might be less than a meter, the slightly larger vessel into the deeper water. Um, once we've conducted our geophysical surveys for mapping the seabed and looking beneath the seabed, we then might um, oh, have had to core the seabed and you can see our raft um, and the tripod which we core down through the seabed there in the middle, and then ultimately, um, obviously putting divers into, into, into the water, but that's the sort of um, the final stage. Next slide, please. Of course, we also work on land, um, coring, as you can see there. Caroline was never a great fan of, of peat bogs, and she didn't like particularly going out into the peat bogs. So um, here you can see Sue and I coring in the peat bogs um, somewhere around Whiteford Hill, I think there. Um, we're also using slightly more crude uh, methods to um, investigate, for example, peak deposits here in the middle slide with the JCB um, at Poole or the Bay of Bruff, I can't remember which site that is. And then Nigel, one of our collaborators in a test pit on the foreshore taking samples. So we combined onshore, offshore. Next slide, please. So here's the Bay of Firth. This is the first site I'm gonna talk about and you can see the two islands um, in there. Um, Damse and Grimbista, uh, and we've surveyed the whole of the seabed um, surrounding those two islands. And that was the first focus of, of, of um, at least my work with, with the Rising Tides project previously, um, Sue and Ali and uh, Caroline who worked in Stennis and Harry. Um, so this is the Bay of Firth is the focus of, of our work. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see a, a, an older map and you can see just the number of um, archaeological sites, prehistoric archaeological sites dotted around that um, coastline. And one of the reasons for going to this um, shallow embayment was tales of divers who reported swimming through arches on the seabed and seeing things like cow buyers. And, and with the um, imagination of an archaeologist, one can, could, could imagine that these were perhaps the remains of Neolithic uh, monuments preserved on the seabed if the sea level hadn't flooded in there too early. So this is one of the reasons why we were first, or Caroline was first interested in this area. Next slide, please. So in order to reconstruct the landscapes beneath the, um, the seabed there, um, next slide, please. Um, the first thing to do is to actually map the shape of the modern seabed. And what you're looking at here is a map of the seabed beneath the sea, surveyed by Richard's little boats, 
Um, and so it's just like an ordinary ordnance survey topographic map, but it's of the bottom of the sea. And you can see the darker the blue, the deeper the water. Um, and the, 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 the greater the green, the shallower the water. And so you can see clearly a number of dark blue sort of splodges on there, which are hollows, um, large hollows in the seabed. And the black stippling are, are rock skerries. And you can see that this landscape is divided into deeper basins separated by rock skerries running between the basins. So that's our first um, view of, of this landscape. This um, survey probably took a number of trips to complete. Um, so it, it, it wasn't quick, but um, it then allowed us to think about techniques, seismic techniques, putting um, pulses of sound into, into, the, into the water that go um, into the underlying deposits and can map not the surface of the of the of the um, uh, the seabed, but actually the different layers beneath the seabed. So by running lines across these features, we could look down into them and see what they were, see what sort of things um, <clears throat> form them, and, and the shape of, of the bodies of, of sediment that might be in these depressions. Because our first instinct was these might be lakes, and and for the Mesolithic archaeologists in the audience, of course, lakes are really important places for human activity. So if we could demonstrate that these darker basin-like features were ancient lakes before the sea came in, then potentially the edges of these lakes might contain um, Mesolithic archaeological remains. So that, that's the logic um, behind our thinking here. Next slide. So looking down into um, these basins, this is a slice, if you like, um, of um, through from the seabed, uh, sea, the sea surface. So the sea surface is, is the top of that um, uh, diagram there, running horizontally from, from one side to the other. The seabed is where you change from that sort of pale greeny color to the, the black and dark red strips. So the, the, the top of the, um, that red strip is, is the seabed. And looking down, you can see various different layers in there. And you can quite clearly see a sort of hollow filled with lots of um, dark and red um, layers, and then, then, then a different pattern beneath it. So this is a slice through the lake. So as soon as we started seeing these, we realized we did indeed have lakes um, in these areas. And the, the, the different um, bands that you can see in there represent different, potentially different geological horizons. So the next thing we needed to do, next slide, please, was to um, drill some cores into the seabed using our Heath Robinson-like um, uh, raft towed out by one of Richard's little boats, put into the held in place by four sea anchors, and then we could um, drill down into the seabed with a, a, a machine called a vibracora that allows us to take a two to three meter um, deep uh, core of the seabed. And you can see the location of some of these cores um, in this diagram, um, one to fourteen there or seventeen, but there aren't all, all not all the numbers are there. But each one of those green dots is, is a core that we sank into. Um, the seabed. Next slide, please. So here we've got that um, section again, that seismic section, and down the left-hand side uh, of the diagram here, you can see a core. Um, you can see it's um, about 10 centimeters thick. That's a, a, a 10 cent, uh, that's a, um, a meter tape, you know, a, a, a 10 centimeter, 70, 80, 90, 100 down the, down the left-hand side there. You can see it's dark, colored at the top. It's then a sort of paler brown, and then it's a very pale um, brown at the bottom. And that's a core through through the, the top part of this, this sequence. And, and what, what we're looking at there in that core, the dark color at the top of the core are um, recent sediments laid down by the sea. The darker, the sort of, sort of mid-brown underneath it um, is a, um, uh, a deposit that shows that it's a bit brackish, it's the, the, the landscape's a bit different, but the, the sediments at the bottom, the pale yellow stuff, are the, are the material that built up um, in the lake and they're all freshwater deposits. So this core records the sea actually coming in, flooding what was formerly a freshwater lake by brackish water conditions, and then the current sort of restricted tidal conditions. Next slide, please. Another core here on the right-hand side comes from, is number 15, which is um, a, a little basin down uh, near Grimbista that we call Monkey Face Bay because um, 
the, the, when you look at um, one of the satellite images, it looks rather like a, a, a monkey's face there. And you can see quite a different sort of core there, all these different la um, layers of pale blue, dark, light um, and and this we believe is is again it's um, in the lake and it's recording conditions in this lake from maybe about twenty thousand years ago through to the the present time and i'll come back to this little lake um right at the end so so the lakes all contain records of the freshwater um, lake at the start being overwhelmed by um, the sea as the sea comes in and floods it floods in across these um, rock skerries next slide please so we can put them all together. These are just some of our cores down the left-hand side there. You can see depth below sea level, um, and you can see the, the, the different elevations of our cores here. I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Um, the numbers beside the cores are radiocarbon dates for when the, um, <coughs> the, the lake was flooded by marine conditions. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Next slide, please. So this is a cartoon showing the lakes um, and their separation by the rock skerries I pointed out before. And you can see we've got um, four lakes, A, B, C, and D. And we know from the um, radiocarbon dates um, that we've extracted from the organic material um, <clears throat> at the point at which the lake is turning from fresh water to brackish water, that the um, Lake C is flooded um, around 8,900 years ago by seawater, but the higher Lake D um, behind this higher barrier is not flooded until about six and a half thousand um, years ago. Next slide, please. Um, I don't think we need that. We'll just flick on, on from that, please. So what that means is that we, we can see that, that the sea has been coming into these um, into these basins at different times. And basically they're coming in during the latter and, and the latter part of the Mesolithic. So how do we look for archaeology? Well, next slide, please. This is a really difficult thing to do. I'm going to talk largely for the moment about um, looking for Neolithic archaeology, because when we went into this um, landscapes to start with, um, we were looking for um, potential places where Neolithic um, burial chambers, villages might have actually been um, present on, on the, um, in what was dry land that was subsequently flooded by the sea, again from these stories which we'd been told by the divers. Um, now what you're looking at in the top picture there is a ledge of rock surrounding the bay that people have piled stones up down towards where Richard is standing with the surveying equipment to make a small jetty. It's a natural feature on the right hand side of that picture, but as you go into the sea, they've exploited a natural feature, they've put rocks on it, and they've continued the shape of the natural feature into the sea to create a jetty that they've been used that they've used to tie up boats it's hard enough to see that feature and understand that feature when it's on dry land once you go into the water and you reduce your visibility to to two three four meters trying to identify that underwater is really difficult so we often struggle to identify and recognize what we're looking at on the seabed. Next slide, please. Here are some pictures from the seabed of um, rocks that we've photographed on the seabed. And you can see in that top picture on the left there, a very regular sort of patterning of the stone blocks there. You can see it on the right bottom right as well with that diver with these large slabs of stone. In this bay, the natural geology are flagstones of sandstone that split and look like rocks. And these are both that top left and that bottom right are natural geological outcrops, but you can see how similar they look to walls or to um, features that humans might have um, built. 
Next slide, please. A very interesting early feature that um, uh, Richard first identified on the, some of the uh, seabed mapping, the bathymetric data, was this enigmatic feature south of uh, Damsey here. It's about 30 meters across, and you can see in that bottom slide there, um, it's got a sort of sharp edge, at least on one side. That is about a meter and a half um, from top to bottom in reality. Um, it's got some sort of internal structure. It looks very, very odd. Next slide, please. There it is um, on the seabed in the left. Um, we mapped it with um, the, the, the bathymetry. We'd looked at it with seismics cutting across it. Uh, we sent divers into the water and there's a diver going off um, the boat into the water to investigate this site. Next slide, please. And this, again, we've seen this picture before. This is what it looks like parts of it on the seabed. Next slide, please. Here again, you can see other parts. So you can see this layering in the rock. It looks very artificial. But again, this is what the natural rocks do in this part of the world. So separating um, one from the other. In parts, you can see stones on end here. And in fact, the um, this sort of pattern of stones runs around the circular feature. So you get this all the way around or part of the way around this, this circular feature on the seabed. So it's quite, quite strange. Next slide, please. Here again, another bit of, uh, of these on edge um, stones here. Next slide, please. On land, here are some very similar sorts of pictures. You, the, the picture on the right, all from the Nessa Brodga. Um, here on the on the left, there you see a, 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 a wall. We, nobody would be saying that that's anything other than a wall. And we've seen things like that, very similar um, on the seabed. You can see in the bottom, uh, the, the bottom slide there in the middle and, and the slide on, on the right there, these blocks on edge, um, which I guess these might have been put into post holes or uh, packing of something. They look very similar to the feature that we have um, on the seabed. Now, the geologists and the archeologists are a bit sort of stumped with what we're actually looking at. Nigel Nailing and some of the Hanson White's archeologists who dived on this site along with um, people from Orkney think that this is not archeological at all. Some of the geologists think they can't come up with an explan a natural explanation for this feature. Um, there are things that could cause similar sorts of features, igneous intrusions, but we've run a magnetometer over it. It's not a, a magnetic um, feature, salt structures, but it doesn't look like that. So we're all scratching our heads in, uh, in our interpretation of what this um, feature actually is. Next slide, please. So there we are, there you can see the shape of this thing on the bottom left there. It's roughly the same size as something like Maze Howe. It's got structure around the edge as, you know, ditches around some of these uh, monuments. Um, very difficult to know what it is. The dating of the flooding of the bay that we now have suggests that this area would have flooded in the late Mesolithic. So it's hard to conceive of this being a humanly constructed feature um, of the landscape um, in the late Mesolithic. Now, maybe we've got our dates wrong. Maybe we don't understand the flooding history and it could be humanly made and something could have kept the water out until, until later than we think it is. It could be a natural feature that has been known about and people inspired by it, who knows? It remains an enigmatic feature on the seabed, but it does emphasize the problem that we have in investigating inter and interpreting some of these seabed features. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna move swiftly on because I realize my time's running out to the Loch Stennis and the work we've been doing in Stennis. Next slide, please. Of course, we all know what's there, so I'm not going to um, 
uh, harp on about the um, the wonderful archaeology um, of of the of the Brogga Isthmus. What I'm going to talk about next slide is the what the lake would have looked like um, in the past, because we believe from our work that the um, the lake itself looked quite different during the um, earlier part of the Neolithic than it does at the present day. So again, we've surveyed this uh, bathymetrically. So you can see the modern uh, bathymetric map there on the left. You can see our interpretation of what the loch looked like on the right. Next slide, please. So here we are zoomed in. So what you're looking at here is our best guess for the, the body of standing water in blue, round about the time when um, the first people came in in the Neolithic, um, in the pale yellowy browny colour. This is what we would have believed, what we believe would have been extensive reed marsh, not open water. Um, rock with boulders um, in, um, in green there, and then uh, rocky uh, margins in, in the brown. So, quite a different sort of landscape than the present time. And I think that's important um, if, if this is um, correct for thinking about people uh, coming into this landscape um, in the Neolithic and what they're doing. Next slide, please. So again, um, <clears throat> we looked beneath the seabed. So these are those slices again, <clears throat> in, um, basically the black color um, at the top of each of these diagrams is the water column. So the seabed is the, the top of that. Um, line, the black is the, the water column, and then the pale gray is, is the seabed. And you can see various layers uh, beneath the seabed. We've published this, by the way, for anybody who's interested in um, uh, Journal of Archaeological Science, I think. Uh, once we've done this work, cord through the cord through the, the, uh, the loch base. Next slide, please. And here you can see one of the cores in the middle there um, with the um, <coughs> Uh, different uh, layers. And again, we've got the bottom from about two meters up to about uh, one meter. We've got freshwater lock environments. Then we've got a, a zone. You can see it says uh, low brackish mixed with freshwater. And you can see two dates on, on the right hand side there. So 5,800 to about 5,600 is the time this uh, loch, Stennis, is. Um, being transformed from a freshwater lake into a brackish marine environment. So it's happening at the beginning of the Neolithic. Um, next slide, please. And again, we've got different cores across the lake and we can model when those changes um, actually took place. So anybody who wants to follow, follow this up, um, track down our paper, please. Next slide, please. So here, we can, here you can see um, I've, we've just plotted the, uh, when the transgression took place, the transgression being the um, <clears throat> transformation of the freshwater into brackish um, lakes, just after the start of, of Neolithic Orkney, <clears throat> just at the beginning of the Ness of Brodga. So big landscape changes um, taking place around the time that these um, first uh, farmers are coming into this landscape. Um, what that means about um, human behavior, um, I'll leave that to, to, to people better qualified than myself to, to, to discuss um, those sorts of things, but an interesting uh, correspondence in time. Next slide, please. There is an, another enigmatic feature in the Loch of Stennis, uh, as opposed to the, the, the uh, Bay of Firth, and that is this feature here, you can see outlined by the, the, the yellow, uh, the, the white box there. Um, this is um, on the west side of Stennis, um, just north of the Brigger Waith, where the um, loch empties um, down to the Bay of Ireland. It's a very strange feature. It's uh, long, narrow. It strikes across the geology, so that's not reflecting the strike of the bedrock geology that's um, underneath it. The, the, the patterns that those rock layers make is not, um, doesn't conform to this. So it from that perspective, it doesn't look like a, a natural geological feature. Next slide, please. Here you can see it again. It's about two meters high. Don't know what it's made of, possibly boulders. Next slide, please. Um, and there you can see it in relation to the, um, the, the, the edge of the marsh. So that map is, is our 
um, early Neolithic map of, of, of the loch. So it would have been lying in what we're modeling as um, wetland um, marsh. Next slide, please. Just to make comparisons there, um, it's of the sort of size of some of these features. I'm not saying it is one of these, but it's an interesting comparison. Um, this could have been dryish land in, in the Neolithic. Um, we need to further investigate this feature. Um, and we, we have attempted to put divers on it, but it was rather covered in kelp when, when they went down on it. So not sure at the moment. Next slide, please. So we have to envisage that um, in the early Neolithic, next slide, please, the sort of environmental reconstructions that look like this are, are not correct. Um, that loch edge on the west side of um, the Ness would not have been open water. It would certainly have been reed swamp for quite some distance out. There was probably uh, rocky um, exposures along there. All of this has implications for, for um, source material, I would suggest, for uh, construction of the various bits of these monuments. So um, I think we need to just bear that in mind. Next slide, please. So to rapidly come to a conclusion, because I think I'm, I'm sort of beginning to run out of time, um, the work hasn't stopped there. We've published quite a bit of it. Um, some of it's been published in the recent geophysical atlas uh, of the landscapes around the World Heritage Site, um, but we're still working on um, a great deal. One of the th things we hope to do, and we were going to do earlier this year, but we haven't got around to it yet, is to go into Monkey Face Bay, which is the little bay south of Grimbista, marked by 15 and 17 on that diagram there, um, to actually prospect for Mesolithic archaeology, obviously something which would have been very close to um, Caroline's heart. The, the, the water depths is so shallow in this um, basin at low tide, we, could, we can get um, people to snorkel in, um, get um, quite easily samples of the seabed's muds, bring them back to the shore, sieve them in the waters around the shore and just see whether we can pick up any traces of flint um, artifacts around the edges of this lake. So it's not, I mean, it's still underwater, but it's, it, it, it's manageable and we could get through quite a lot of sieving um, if, um, in, in a short period of time. So this is something that we've been talking um, uh, with Scott and Ben from um, Orkney. Uh, college about doing in conjunction perhaps with some students and, and, and just seeing if we can find anything at all. Might not work, but it's it's our shallowest lake. It's our best bet for picking up archaeology and it would be the easiest to manage. So, so that's top of my list to do anyway. Next slide, please. We've still got um, coring and paleoenvironmental work around scale to complete. We've been um, <clears throat> mapping um, the, um, the geology, this is a geophysical plot from um, our work there. We've been coring again. It's obviously all, all of this is on land. There's some very nice sequences um, of uh, peats uh, and sands that are present in this basin just to the southeast of um, Scara Bray that will hold really important paleoenvironmental records. And, and we've been working on that. Next slide, please. Here you can see one of our transects across that basin, um, and that's about uh, five meters, six meters um, thick around borehole 116 in the middle of that diagram. So we, we need to complete that. Next slide, please. We've sort of not forgotten, but um, in all our work on mainland, we've still got material from Pole and the Bay of Bruff on Sunday. So um, that's uh, still to be completed, and, and we, we, we need to go back uh, and do that. Uh, next slide, please. So that's about it, folks. Um, as the cartoons used to say, um, just want to, uh, I apologize if I've missed anybody out on the first list of the, the Rising Tides project. Thank you to all these people who, and these organizations who have um, funded or collaborated or worked um, with us and shared knowledge um, with us. And of course, thank you to Caroline for, for um, setting this up and for all the, the, the great chats we've had and all the wonderful support. And I hope this has been, um, I hope whatever you're watching this from Caroline, um, you're satisfied it's in good hands. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Martin. I mean, there was, uh, you know, you covered so much ground, uh, literally and and metaphorically. Um, and if we can keep your, your video on for just a little bit longer, uh, oh. because we've had some really nice questions from our audience uh, submitted through Slido. And there was a slide from Slido on the screen there for a second as well. So if you have any more audience, any more questions to submit from the audience, feel free to uh, do so. And we'll try to get through at least some of them. Um, but of course, there is only about five minutes left, so uh, we'll we'll try to be quick about it. Um, again, thank you so much, Martin. And um, there's been quite a lot of questions to, about what is the impact of water being submerged in water in order, you know, on 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 the way in which you approach dating uh, material that you find. That you know, how 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 is that managed? And also noting that quite a lot of of um, on land side, sites which are still online, are close to the sea. In Orkney, in particular, you know, Scarabray comes to mind immediately. Of course, right, right, right on the shore, um, and we know, we know, you know, tight, right, rising, um, rising oceans because of the climate change. How can we protect those sites? You know, it kind of goes hand in hand, I guess. Well, I think there's a number, there's a number of um, points there to be made. I mean, I think when sea levels come in fast enough depend on the local geomorphology, they can be submerged quick enough that they're effectively preserved quite nicely. So, I mean, all, all of our sites in the Bay of Firth, um, there may have been a little bit of disturbance at the top, but they were probably submerged sufficiently fast that um, uh, preservation is reasonably good. I think where you get a lot of destruction is where the coast stays the same or just moves inland through coastal erosion at a well, it depends what you mean by fast or slow, but, you know, it, if the sea level is staying approximately where it is or only slightly rising, you're going to get more damage than if the sea level is coming up quite quickly. But that will vary on, on, on different places. Obviously, once, once it's submerged by the sea, the water and the waterlogging keeps most of the, the material that we're interested in um, quite nicely preserved. Um, it just means it's much more difficult to get at it so any work in the sea is far more costly than work on the land because it just takes so much longer um to do to to to, to find it and and to, to to get at it and and certainly to excavate it um in terms of what can be done about it, it that's largely down to governments and deciding what they're going to protect and what they're going to to let go and i think um you know we're all familiar with um, managed retreat projects um, that let um, the, the sea back into two areas. And, and some of those managed retreat projects, of course, are showing up their own archaeology, which wouldn't be um, shown up if managed retreat wasn't going to be allowed to take place. So it's a really difficult um, thing to, to address and there are going to be pros and cons um, about what's going to be exposed and how we can do it and, and I think you know all we can do as archaeologists is flag up that are interesting deposits there and hope that if areas are not going to be protected and that managed retreats going to go on that sufficient is done to allow us to record these things as they take place and 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 the you know as citizen scientists um you know, the public has a huge role to play in this. And, and, and it's really important that we, we get the message out and that people are interested and um, report what they see to us because we're the best will in the world. We can't be everywhere at once. So we rely on the public to tell us what's being exposed, where, and then we can um, mobilise, you know, local groups um, to work in conjunction with um uh, you know the the archaeologists to to do our best to um, to record that. Now, I, I don't think that's probably answered a lot of the questions, but it's the best I can do at the present time. It's a very good answer, and, and as I said, there's quite a lot of complexity in in the question as well. Um, now, speaking, you've, you've mentioned just how difficult it is to to do uh, you know archaeology under the sea in a sense. Um, so uh, there's some questions here. So, you know, were it, was it particularly difficult carrying out a seismic survey in such shallow water? Um, and also, how did you choose the exact the five the five sites that you mentioned um, on the, on the five blocks? Um, was there like a particular methodology? Was there some pre knowledge that there be 
potentially interesting things there? How how did you actually go about it? Well, it, as I say, it first started out because we thought there might be Neolithic archaeology on the bottom. We thought it might be relatively simple to find it, which was just sh shows how little we knew about the problems that we were about to, to encounter. Once we started the survey and we realized, realized there was sort of quite significant humps and bumps, we started to think our oh, lakes, you know, th these are potentially um, drowned lakes. So we focus our seismic survey on the deeper parts of the lakes to start with. Um, yes, there are problems when you come into very shallow water, of water depth of less than two metres um, with, with doing that. But, you know, going out over the deeper areas, we could get a sense of what was going on. So once we had the, the basic mapping, then the idea was to, to construct transects of boreholes across it to see how the geology was changing and what, what you're sort of looking for are those deposits right at the edge of a lake where the lake goes into a terrestrial swamp or where you actually get some drier ground. Now, those are quite difficult to spot. And we're sort of, um, this is why we're interested in what we call Monkey Face Bay, because we think there will be those sorts of edge situations. While we can't model them very precisely with the seismics because of the, the, the thinning nature of the deposits, we know within 20 meters where they're going to be um, and we can then you know deploy the diver richard and anybody else who we can arm twist into going out into the water to um to collect the samples and bring it on shore to people like me who don't like going out and getting wet i don't mind going on a boat but i don't particularly like getting in the water um to sieve it and, and actually see so it's a sort of stepped approach of, of sort of logical deduction and sometimes you're right and sometimes you know you're wrong um and uh, it it's hit and miss the tides obviously cause problems if you get white caps at all out on the water it basically you can't work because we can't hold the boat steady enough for the for the drilling we've we've learned our lesson on that and trying to work in those sorts of conditions so yeah it's a combination of logic and luck well th thank you so much uh, martin for sharing this with us uh, you know, it's, it's very clear that Caroline's legacy lives on, both in, in the research, the work you do, as well as the enthusiasm you bring to share the work and the, the finds uh, with, with us and, and with, with other audiences. So, so thank you again. Um, thank of you. course, thank you as well to our technical team who made sure that um, this, this talk was actually possible. Uh, please feel free, uh, dear audience, to drop us uh, any feedback to this event. I believe the link is now being shared in the YouTube chat. And you can also find it uh, at the bottom of the Slido list. Um, and of course, Orkney International Science Festival uh, continues. Uh, this is the last event for tonight, but tomorrow morning, uh, you can join us fresh and bright at 10 a.m. Uh, talking about to extinction and beyond, uh, the Exers Blue and the California Condor. I'll leave it a bit mysterious. Uh, so this is a virtual event, so you can join us here on online. Uh, in the meantime, of course, uh, do not forget to like us on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, as well as, of course, like us on our YouTube channel. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful session and have a lovely evening. Good night. <laughs>